Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. My guest today is a trailblazer in space and an explorer on Earth. Dr. Roberta Bonder was the first female Canadian astronaut and the first neurologist in space. She spent eight days on the Space Shuttle Discovery performing more than 40 experiments and taking photographs of our planet from her small window. She has since traveled the world taking extraordinary images of landscapes and wildlife. As a doctor, a scientist, an educator, and a photographer, she has spent decades connecting people to that precious planet she saw from her window more than 30 years ago. Dr. Bonder, hello. Hi there. So did being in space change you? I mean, some astronauts talk about that, being moonstruck or... It did, but I wanted it to. Uh, I went up there with a very open mind, but with my Earth values about life, etc. And I must say that the extraordinary view out the window was, was one of the things, there are a few, that, but that was the, probably the main thing that I felt was such an extraordinary gift. Because down here, we know we're on a planet, I mean, we learn about it in school, but in space you actually see the edge of the planet and you see the black universe beyond with stars that don't twinkle and this dead light that's thousands if not millions of years away from us and you look at the earth and it's glowing with the reflected sunlight so you, it's in a futuristic vessel going around the planet so basically you're in the past the present and the future all at the same time but to see it as a planet is very sobering or it should be sobering to any of us uh, because there's there's nothing out there coming at us except maybe some stuff in the odd meteor and sunlight. But outside of that, this is what we have. Uh, so it's quite extraordinary that we do things to the planet and to each other that really is quite wasteful. There was a, a quote I was reading by Edgar Mitchell, who I guess was uh, Apollo 14. You know, he said, you develop an instant global consciousness, uh, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. That's right. At least that's what I thought. I don't think everybody that goes up uh, feels that way or I don't think there are a lot of people when they come back do anything with it because they go on to either the next flight or something in their personal life or their professional life steers them away from a commitment they might have made to themselves when they do have this view of Earth, but I just wanted to keep it like that and keep it close to me so I could do something. Well, and you wonder who has the ability. I mean, obviously you've got to be a scientist. You know, that's how you got there. But there has to be sort of an artistic temperament or a poetic temperament in some ways to be able to put it in words and share it with people. One needs actually contemporary wise uh, look no further than William Shatner because when he came back from his very short voyage uh, he wanted to talk about and here's an actor that I'm sure had a script in his head but it just went out the window uh, when he came back he was unprepared to look at the blackness of space and the very thin aspect of the atmosphere which is only visible to his eyes because he's a human being uh, and in the visible, what we call the visible spectrum because it looks thin because the sun's reflected off it and that's what he could see but it for him it was a matter of, of death it was a matter that we're, we're on the surface of this planet there's nothing between us and death because we get too high up there's no air to breathe uh, there'd be no light so I think he was profoundly affected. So when he was crying. Yeah, so when we think about trying to get ourselves emotionally set for a specific situation, how does one cope with seeing either death or life in front of you evolving in an instant, whether it's something very bad that ends a life or, or, the, or the birth of a new life? Sometimes those are things we can't, no matter how tough we think we are and how well scripted we can be, emotional moments for a human being are very, very difficult to structure in advance and to carry it off. Uh, the story I find incredible is you as a little girl. Like, really? Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, wanted to be in space, collected rockets. Like, you were obsessed with this. And the chances of you as a little girl in Sault Ste. Marie at that time getting into space were like zero. Canadians weren't going and girls weren't going. But you were fascinated by it. 
I was very, very fortunate because my parents and my sister, who's 15 months older than me, very, very supportive of all kinds of crazy things. They were really keen on learning. And so for me growing up, it wasn't the fact that there wasn't a space program, there were stars. So as long as there were stars, the possibility was there. Just because I was Canadian or the fact that we didn't have rockets or nothing had left the surface of the planet because I'm that old, that didn't, that didn't affect my parents' encouragement of me and my reading and my learning and my understanding. I always found when I interviewed astronauts over the years, their resumes were so gobsmacking <laughs> dense. I'd think, did you start at five? You know, like <laughs> on your pilot's license and accumulating PhDs. I mean, you spent 18 years at university. Yeah, where, where were you headed? Most people would ask me where I got the money from, you know, but uh, no, seriously, I worked, I, at one point from my PhD, I was working three jobs just to be able to support uh, myself, but I look at my, my career not as a straight line, like a lot of people want to have this like straight path to being an astronaut, but it's more like a pinball machine, you know, you go bouncing off the surfaces, you learn one thing, you take the energy and you go somewhere else and you give a little bit of energy up, but you, you become different, you become, you, you really do evolve. So you studied biology, mm. um, neurology, medicine. But it all fits together when you start in retrospect and you look up. But my first university degree is a double degree in agriculture and zoology. Now people say, hey, you don't need that to be an astronaut. Well, guess what? I got picked because I had this broad background in my first degree at the university because I had such a diversity of, of programs that I, that I deliberately took. When I got into the space program, I thought, gee, you know, I could have done another degree. Engineering might have been very handy. And then, of course, when I got that, maybe an MBA, that would have really been good, too. So I started thinking, thinking about all the, the, the things, the rich, the rich value uh, out there, the richness of education and, and what we can do and become when we learn these things. I mean, it's, it's quite incredible. You heard on the radio that, you know, the Canadian Space Agency was looking for astronauts. And was that like, oh, I, yeah. yes, yeah. all this is, here's where I'm going. Was that a moment, like you had your application in a, a nanosecond. No, I think it was the second one in. I think a grandmother beat me there. But <laughs> uh, yes, I was driving and I heard this on the radio and I thought, oh, you know, I'm driving the car and going, I, how, how do I find this? And trying to figure out like where, they didn't say where you applied. It was just like something on the radio. And I had been following the, the uh, program in the United States for many, many years. My grandfather's an American, and I have my green card, and I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of all these connections. We spent a lot of time in the States have li living in a border town in, in Ontario. And so I followed Sally Ride. I, I followed all the, the original women and, and the space shuttle, and uh, I remember watching it land, and I'm saying, I am going to do that, even if I have to move from here. I'm going to do that. I just, like, I was so committed. And then when I heard it on the radio, like, I don't know, a few months later, well, oh, wow. This you is know, my chance. This is my chance. Yeah, but your chance among, what, thousands of applicants. Well, I figured I had the right stuff. Ha, 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 ha. Speaking of the so, right stuff, I mean, they do. They did poke, prod, haze, you yeah, know. Yeah, they did. That was such so a good the movie. movie that you thought, because I was going to ask you if any of the movies really get either the astronaut program or space right. Well, that movie was fantastic. It was at a time when I needed that movie. Uh, one of the parts of our training uh, was to go on this, um, this airplane that did this parabolic loop so he could be a bit weightless at the top. So they'd, they'd pull 2G up and then for about 25 seconds at the top you'd have free fall. And then you'd go down again, 2G pull out, 2G. And it, can you imagine how sickening this can be with all the smell of the oil inside the plane? Uh, so for the novice, which I was, uh, going my first time in this vehicle for some training, I was wearing an orange uh, flight suit. And I was sick as a dog because they wanted me to be sick because they were looking at skin pallor and all kinds of crazy things and, uh, inside this aircraft. So they wanted to know how motion sickness was affecting it. That wasn't anything to do with, I was an astronaut in tra training, but I came out of there thinking, I can't do this. I, who, who likes vomiting? <laughs> who, who, who really enjoys that? That's like really bad. And, and so I went, I remember being 
being at this hotel and just throwing, throwing up even afterwards, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can do this. The movie The Right Stuff was on TV. I flicked, it, I flicked the TV on to try to distract me and there was the scene where they're walking down in their silver flight suits down the hallway and I'm going, yes, those <laughs> men can do it, I can do it. And I never look back. I don't like orange, but hey. But you know, you got to basically the top of the list, you're about to go, and then the Challenger exploded. So, you know, manned space flight stopped and basically eight years. You had to wait another eight years. Tick, 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 tick. Like Yeah, it did tick by. I mean, I, people have said, like, I, I was on the space shuttle, so in those days they were not very long flights, but it was the precursor of the International Space Station. So it couldn't be expected the shuttle wouldn't stay up much, too much longer. So I said it was a year for every day I was in flight. So I was in flight for eight days. It took eight years of training for those eight days. So when I, I think about the time and how the time was spent, a lot of it was trying to reconfigure the reason why I wanted to do this. Because the which cameras, was Which was what? Well, the reason, well, because I wanted to know what was up there. I wanted to know what the Earth looked like. I, wa I felt that the adventure of doing it would somehow uh, make me different. Uh, would, I was different enough, but it would actually make, make me view life differently. And the Challenger accident was so sobering. And one of the worst parts for, for any of us um, with the loss of human life is watching Kristen McAuliffe's parents because the cameras are right right on them and it was so awful. It was so awful. It's just so dreadful. And I really had to think twice then, more than twice, about what I was putting my mother and my sister through because my mother was an only child. My father had died uh, before the Challenger accident uh, suddenly. And I felt this was a very selfish thing for me to be doing. I was pulling everybody in my slipstream because they supported me, uh, but I wasn't really supporting them. And it took that for me to start being a bit more soul searching about what my goals were really, how they were really affecting other people. Mm -hmm. So all of that was very sobering that you know, something can happen. Of course. And yet, you know, the pictures of you boarding, like, you look yes. euphoric. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was exciting. I mean, I, first of all, I think people uh, in Canada hadn't seen one of the, the, a Canadian fly since a Challenger accident. So we only had one Canadian had flown before, but man. And so now the next Canadian flying after the Challenger accident happened to be a woman. And I think that sent a great message because here was this now this brave person who's a woman taking all this bailout training and wearing this orange flight suit with this helmet on, these heavy pants, and she's, she's going to do it and she's representing something, representing women all around the world. And she's with a crew of six men. So I think to, to, to have got that far and have achieved what I achieved made me very happy. I was, in, I was right at the pinnacle of my training. Mm -hmm. uh, so the excitement for me was, yes, I'm finally gonna do this, and I'm alive to, to now to even to see it. So tell me about the experiments in space. Experiments are very hard to do, and they're, it's really hard to train for them, to do them in space. Because you get up there, you get disoriented, and things don't look the same. You get, well, we call it this, having the space stupids when you first get up because things don't like, you know, on the ground it's like so simple. You just do A, do B, do C, and you're yawning. You get into space, you got A. Oh, that's A. They label it A. You know, it, because your brain doesn't think as clearly uh, when you start flying. And, and we know this is because um, when we float in space, the body fluids float as well. And so we have about a liter of blood in each leg that gravity is pulling down. Just ask anybody with varicose veins. It's pulling it down on the legs. And the veins have one-way valves so that pushes up and the valve opens and the blood goes back up and then the valve is supposed to come back down and stop blood from going back. So you can imagine it going to space, the blood gets pushed up, but there's no gravity going to be pulling it back down on the legs. It stays up. There's a shift in fluid. And so that 
that really, it, it really goes against thinking clearly, if I can put it like that. So I want to ask about gender, because it, it's interesting. A couple of things that I've read that you wrote. You know, one about, you, you say, a lifetime of coping with issues of role and gender vanished, you know, as you entered and got into space. And you said, I, but I've certainly been bruised by struggling upstream on Earth. So how bruised and how, you know, how hard had it been for you as a woman? It still is, <coughs> excuse me, it still is hard. Uh, I find that there, I think one of the hardest things now is to go back. I mean, I'd like to go back to my 16-year-old self or my 12-year-old self and, and just give me some advice. You, you felt you always had to fight that. Yeah, always. And, and, right and through, in astronaut training and through university well, even. And, I mean, yeah. I mean, I took, a, I, I specialized in something that years ago there weren't a lot of women, not a female neurologist. And uh, there were a lot of people biased against uh, women doing, doing things because you really are supposed to pick. Like I remember one, uh, one guy when I was in medical school, uh, one of our mentors said, well, you know, he said the best specialty for women is ophthalmology. And I thought, yeah, I like eyes. You know, that'll be great. Uh, and the, but he gave me the reason. He says, because then you can go and have a family and can you do your practice? And well, that's not the reason why you do ophthalmology. You do ophthalmology because you like ophthalmology. You know, maybe people don't. Maybe people pick things because they have to balance things in the career or understand that. But if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to do well. But you always felt you had to fight. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, because, yeah. and it's interesting because, you know, you've also said, you know, after the flight, I mean, what an achievement. I was not granted an opportunity to train further with NASA. Yeah. They said your contract's over. That and was they kept the, worst. the men. That's right. I mean, that probably, I, I've had three really down times in my life, and that was one of the most stellar examples uh, that, I, that I'd come back to the, the space agency that was housed in a building in Ottawa after being in Parliament and feted by all the, 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 you know, picture with the Prime Minister, everything, and the same day going in a taxi down to the space, the, uh, the space building in the space office in Ottawa to be hauled into a conference room with no other support, no HR person, nothing, no heads up, and this guy who was an engineer uh, said to me, well, your contract's over. And I'm the only one, you know, like we're in a big boardroom, and I'm looking, what? What, what do you mean my contract's over? The Neurolab's going. I'm, I'm our, the only neurologist in the Canadian space program. The Neurolab's going. I should be on that. You know, th there's no reason why I shouldn't be doing that. You guys, but there was nothing. He yes. said, we can keep you for a year, but you give up your space medicine research as of today. And we can, you can do some... Uh, Did you ever find out why? Like, no. Well, I, you know, for years I never told anybody this because... Was it just humiliating or...? Oh, well, it was, well, it was, it wasn't humiliating. It was... Infuriating! It was infuriating. And one of the hardest things I had to do was to try to re, uh, reconfigure my life and myself at, from that second forward. I mean, I tried talking to people, so I wrote this lovely letter of resignation, which they wanted me to do because I had to leave. And I said in it, you know, that I wish I had had more opportunity to use the skill set that you know, basically the taxpayers had paid up for to have me do this thing. And that I, that I, I felt that it was miss, a missed opportunity. So what, do you, what did you do with that? Because I know, you know, resilience is something yeah. that really interests you, looking at other people's lives and your own. So it was a question of, Moving on, so you you came to photography and and a vision of communicating. It seemed about the planet and Earth, and yeah. and making your mission in that. Yes, I had planned on photographing as much of Earth's landscape as as I could, and I did. I got a I had really developed a passion for deserts, and the and I, I did a, a small book called The Arid Edge of Earth. Uh, but all those things became very important to me when I looked out the window, and I didn't have enough time to look out the window a lot, but when I did see it, it just made it more and more imperative that I communicate that somehow. And one of the projects you're involved in now is, is looking at sp space for birds and mm. migration corridors, and again, back to your animals, and you know, this from space, this is like a great project for you. 
Yes, I became a, a principal investigator with, with NASA for migratory bird work about I, maybe seven years ago. Now it's hard to tell with, with COVID what the, what the time frame is. But I decided that it would be nice to have three perspectives of migration. Uh, and I've always liked flight. When I was a little girl, I would do projects on birds. And so it, it, when I was in space, didn't, I didn't hear bird song. I didn't hear any bird sounds. It was nothing. When you look at the planet, all you hear is human noise behind you of machinery. It, it, was, it was a revelation that this is what it would be like if we didn't have birds. There would be no sound. And we associate that with, with romance. We associate it with, with agriculture. We associate sounds of nature with so many wonderful things for our mental health, too. And so I thought, well, when I have the opportunity, it would be great to get these three perspectives. Uh, space perspective looking, because we can't even see the whole migratory pathway from one shot from space. We have to take multiple samples to do that. And then I could go and, and photograph them from a helicopter, which I do, to take the, the relationships of the landscape, of land and water, the bird's eye view. And then down on the surface, more the behaviors, whether they're flock behaviors of the lesser flamingo or individual behaviors of the endangered whooping crane. And to try to get people to understand that life is so precious and these, some of these creatures are in danger because of habitat loss, but this is another way of communicating it. But I thought the three perspectives would tie it all together. So that's what I've done. I, I, through the Earth Observation people at, at uh, Johnson Space Center, we set up coordinates of different parts of the migratory pathways from for about seven species that I've really been wanting to follow. Uh, send them to the space station, and I give certain criteria, and they get uh, these images. I have to go through thousands of them. Uh, but it's, it's worth it. It's really worth it to try to get this picture. You've had so many honors. You know, you're wearing your pins, honorary docs and stuff. But one of the coolest, I think, is there, what is it, eight schools named after you? It's something like that. I just think that would be. I mean, do you connect with those kids? Are they your kids in effect? Or Well, actually, yes. I remember my mother coming down to the opening of one of the schools in the Toronto area. And uh, she, had, she was a retired teacher. She got, went back to university, well, went to university as a mature adult and got her degree. And so she would, loved teaching. It was instilled with us when we, were, when we were young. So I wanted to bring her down to the opening of the school. And so she went in and the, the there were, I don't know how many hundreds of these young students in elementary school, and they all had t-shirts on with a bonder name on it. <laughs> and my mother always wanted grandkids, which, you know, I couldn't give her. Uh, she saw all these kids and she said, look at all the grandchildren. <laughs> so that was good. Aww. Yeah, yes. The kids, when they see you, though, must look at you like, <laughs> Yes, she still, exists. Yeah, she's, she's still alive. alive. Yeah, no, <laughs> she's still alive. And look, she's a. She, and I said, showed them pictures of me in black and white, and they say, "Why isn't there color, Miss?" <laughs> <laughs> but do you are you happy to be a role model? Yeah, I consider myself actually a cheerleader for women and a role model for men because women know they can do this stuff, but I have to be a role model so men can see that we can do it, but also that they can also do things. Because I don't stop and say it's just about women. It's about all of us. And we need all the diversity, regardless of whatever the gender identification is. We need our total resources on this planet. Because as I said, from space, you know, that's all we got. That is all we've got. And, and it's so beautiful, Pierre. So what does being Canadian mean to you? It's heavily influenced my... Uh, my connection to the natural world of Earth. I think if I hadn't had that experience in, in Canada, because so much we have got, we have so much in the way of natural forests and natural land, and we're, there, there are all the issues of climate change, but setting, setting that uh, uh, not aside to ignore it, but just trying to incorporate another thought is that I grew up in, in a border town between Sioux Canada and Sioux Michigan. And uh, in Sioux Canada, we have a lot more of the access to the, the Canadian Shield, it's called, the, the Cambrian, the, some of the oldest rocks in the world, uh, the lichens, uh, the boreal forest uh, that's north. Uh, all these things, I think in Canada, we have this, these natural lands that, uh, that Indigenous people have enjoyed 
their life supporting and learning from. And when I was growing up, it was that, it was that connection and trying to understand what the role is of a human being on the planet, given all of this, this natural world that's around us. So I think in, being a Canadian has allowed me to experience that at a level that I might not have had uh, had I been somewhere else in the world. Well, it's been a total pleasure to see you. You're so impressive. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Dr. Ponder. Thank you. And uh, thank you for watching. And we'll be back next week with uh, another edition of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Ted and Alice Kernahan, as well as the following donors The Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, David and Cheryl Carr, Jim and Sandra Pitbledu, Tony and Sherry Fell, Bryce and Nikki Douglas, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Charles and Marilyn Bailey, Michael McCain and family, Richard Pilosoff, Clench House Foundation, Kathy and George Dombrowski, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.